Our next speaker on reuse is Danny Tucker. Danny Tucker is the founder of Vessel. And Perpetual, co-founder. Perpetual, co-founder, co-founder. Okay, and she'll be telling us about the opportunities and challenges to, to transition towards reusable food packaging. Please welcome Danny on stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here, Food Packaging Forum, an honor to be amongst all these bright minds. I appreciate it. I am really excited to be here. If my slides uh, come up, one second, I get to, uh-oh, uh-oh, don't go ahead. All right, so I, I hope everyone had caffeine or something else during the coffee break because we're really going to sort of parachute through the landscape of reuse and we're going to start at that 10,000 foot level and we're going to go very quickly and then hopefully slow down a little bit and look at the opportunities and challenges facing reuse. I'm Dr. Dagny Tucker. I'm actually a designer. My PhD is in international peace and conflict. And if you want to know how that PhD ended up in a deep dive of reuse, we should have dinner. But it might have something to do with the fact that we all recognize we have a massive plastic waste and pollution problem. What I think everybody doesn't necessarily recognize is that reuse can play a significant role in addressing that problem. In fact, according to Pew Charitable Trust, reuse systems have the greatest potential to reduce plastic pollution compared to source reduction, material substitution, mechanical and advanced recycling. So, of course, we have this long established history of reuse. We think of the milkman all the time, some more than others, and we had to transform these systems, of course, because now, now we're in modernity. And so we've reinvented for modern contexts and lifestyles. Whether those lifestyles themselves are sustainable is for another conference. Now, reuse has really grown quite exponentially over the last 10 years. And really what we're interested in are these sections here, refill all of the things that have to do with food packaging, particularly reusable cup and container programs. How did we get this growth? Well, we had this very little start a long time ago. Recup is here today. Some of the early starters, it was a very small and nascent industry across the world. And then something happened. That's the cue. Something happened. There was this incredible wave of awareness that came. And I think in part it has to do with many of the brilliant scientists in this room, others working on the problems with ocean pollution. In particular, I think we hit this moment in time. And National Geographic, this, this won so many awards and it just lit the world on fire, this image. People, they suddenly had some way to really grasp what this pollution meant. And then we had this explosion. You see reusable service companies show up all across the world in lots of different iterations, from reusable packaging, B2B, which has been there for a long time, we'll talk about it, foodware, et cetera, et cetera. Wonderful. Following that, we have our wonderful guest from today, from Ellen MacArthur. We begin to see publications and reports. People are talking about reuse and more and more. And despite this 2020 experience, we may remember, reports continue to grow. Research. We look at lots of collaborations from lots of different organizations, multi-stakeholder collaborations, some organized by NGOs, WEF. We have Zero Waste Europe that's working on collaborations. So across the world, a variety of collaborations, which I think we all already recognize is necessary in the reuse space. Of course, with with this growth, we begin to see policy. I'm not going to go into this. PPWR, we got to talk a little bit about the policy. Lots of different reuse-specific targets in several EU countries. We're starting to see in the US EPR packaging schemes that are going to promote reuse, incentivize reuse. Then we have the regulatory side. People said, 
oh, what's this? You have health departments who are saying, I'm sorry, what? You want to take this item and leave with it and, and drop it somewhere and wash it that's not at a restaurant? I'm sorry, we're not going to say yes to this. You can imagine this was a five-year process, but we now have United States Food and Drug Administration food code that's going to land within the next year that allows consumer third-party reuse service providers and businesses themselves to provide reusable foodware in a safe way with best practices. This is a real, real win in this space. And then, of course, the LCA wars. So we've talked a lot about LCAs already today, and I won't go into them, but I think things like the UP scorecard could play a role in the future in looking at how do we level these LCAs. I know that when we heard from our friend who's working at the EU level on Zoom today, he was saying, look, I do not know how to evaluate these LCAs. When are we going to get an LCA that's transparent, that everybody can put their information into, and we can have a scientific baseline for making decisions? It's really necessary and needed in this space. So wonderful groups have come to try and answer some of those questions and to try and accommodate. We have Fernando here. He's going to be on stage later from New Era, which is one of our first really, truly robust industry groups representing those companies actually doing the reuse service provision. This is huge. We finally have a voice at the table, whereas otherwise we love the large industry players that are here. Thank you, Migros and others. But we need a voice of people who are actually doing this work on the ground. Additionally, we need that harmonization and standards. Anastasia spoke about the use of infrastructure that already exists. Yes, and. So if we have a million different types of containers and cups and people are using different technology, et cetera, at some point we have to have interoperability. And so how will we achieve that interoperability? We're going to need to put standards in place that help give some guidelines so these systems in one city can have multiple operators, different food types, et cetera. For us, we're talking about primary packaging in this room, the continuation of this conversation, but I want to say transport and secondary pa packaging, 30 years plus of real success at a scale in implementing reusables. We can make supply chains work for reuse. End of story. So grocery and vending, I think we're really familiar with a lot of these concepts. Migros talked about some of them, CPGs, others. Then we have delivery and takeout foodware. So with delivery and takeout foodware, I just want to say this, this, is, this is an interesting, this is where we hit the point of our challenge. We know this opportunity is huge. Our first challenge is this. So B2B works because it's B2B. Take out food and delivery, you're now going from a business to consumer. So you have that question, right? In, in a linear economy, it just it goes to the trash. The infrastructure is all there, provided by municipality and your taxes, by the way, to throw that item away. And then it goes away. But in a reuse system, you need to recover it. So we understand how to do reuse in these single site. Big event venues, every one of them, they should be using reuse. Call Anastasia, call uh, Kuki, who's here, call whoever. You can do it today. For open networks, it's much more complicated, right? Because that item, it goes to a business, it gets checked out, it leaves. The Migros is like, yeah, how do I get those items back? Because then maybe it goes, it leaves a grocery store, it goes home, then do I have to return it? It gets very complicated once you transfer it over to the consumer and you have to get it back to them. This is where we're seeing some challenges. But just for those of you who have never used a reuse system, I'm going to do this really quick. The cup is already there, the container is already there, yay. You check it out. Just like a library book. You borrow library books all the time. Some of them are $100. You return them, right? Or you pay for them. Enjoy your food or drink wherever you want to go. Drop off your container. Or in some cases, we're seeing municipalities get on board with home collection right alongside your other waste items. Containers are collected, washed, sanitized, Voila. So just because I know where some of us are scientists, some of us are communications experts, let's get everyone on the same page. Then we redistribute them, right? Makes sense. Lots of these players are playing, but the thing is they've all been really small scale. We've heard about pilot after pilot after pilot. Why? Everybody in this room seems ready. Even that re reusable water bottle is like, hey, we're ready. <laughs> Why hasn't it scaled? 
okay? It is this. We're just, Justin mentioned it a little bit in his talk about the reuse worksheet. The bottom line is you're asking reuse to compete in an uneven playing field. The infrastructure already exists for a linear economy and for single use. And you're saying, oh, I don't understand why these consumers aren't using this container. They only have to check it out and then leave with it and then rinse it and then bring it back and do all this other stuff rather than just drop it on a trash can that already exists. Of course, you're, you're not going to get behavior change in that way. You're going to get deep greens. We need to think about this differently. These are big challenges. You have to achieve convenience and affordability for the end user. You're just due. We're not designing for behavior change. We need to start to designing for where behaviors are at because we've trained people to operate that way for the last 50 years. Design for that. Recognize you've built infrastructure for linear, wasteful economies and reprioritize yourself to build infrastructure or transition infrastructure for safe, sustainable, reusable items. Environmental benefits, they're going to get unlocked at scale. It's really hard to run these systems incrementally. You just, you're just not going to see the same environmental benefits as you get when you have really sophisticated logistics with tracking, you're optimizing your system. So even the LCAs that are coming out right now, they're, not, they're either winning, let me be clear, the science shows they win. But they're going to be even better when we optimize. And finally, it's really hard, oh, well, I want to say environmental benefits, I also want to say economic there, because this is a, a unit economics game. So it's hard to reach unit economics when you're just incrementally adding 10 stores, 15, etc. Finally, we don't have governance models. They just, this, this framework hasn't existed yet. Cities, they want to do this. I talked to somebody here today from Switzerland. She wants to do this, but the governance models for communities don't exist. How do we put RFPs out or invite providers to come in? Is it contracted? Who owns the assets? How do we move them around? Now, models exist, of course. We've heard from Tobias, from Germany, from the pooling system in Germany, and they have that sorted out. But they're talking about glass bottles, and now we're talking about a whole variety of containers, CPG, prepackaged to go, so we need to rethink think about that governance again. And this immersive scale is, is really, it's, it's the key in my opinion. Um, we need to give consumers an experience. We'll only know if these systems work when they're, they're so ubiquitous and normalized that it's just like, of course I'm going to use that reusable. It's everywhere and it's so easy to drop off and everything's already set up. So really this in my opinion and for all the reasons I already said is going to be incredibly important. Turns out there's a couple of organizations working on this. Of course, we have people that are writing about this and thinking about this, but here we have a couple of organizations. I'm happy to be a part of Perpetual, but I also partner a lot with Zero Waste Europe, and they have what's called the Reuse Fan Card Project. They're working in six cities in Europe, and their goal is to develop a blueprint, and I think I'm just going to talk about that here in a second, a blueprint so that we can replicate. So they're working, I think, in Berlin, in Paris, two cities in Belgium. They're working in Rotterdam, Barcelona, somebody else. Where else? Fernando? An another, Berlin. And so they're working in an interesting landscape because they're working in really big cities where reuse providers already exist. And they're trying to figure out what does that governance look like? How do we get interoperable? How do we make it work from a systems thinking perspective? They have a big job to do that. Perpetual, the organization I'm with, is doing it from a slightly different perspective. And I'll tell you more about that in a second. So for us, really, we're looking at trying to create that immersive experience. What we hear from investors in this space, if you're a reuse startup, what we hear this big pushback from McDonald's and everybody else, nobody's going to use it. We haven't seen scale. We don't know if it really works. So we're saying, okay, well, let's see what that looks like. So we're actually working with four U.S. cities to bring them all the support that they need to think through a systems design for reuse from the bottom up. We do exceptional amounts of mapping and engagement. We chose cities, well, we invited cities. And out of those cities, we chose cities that were between about 50 and 150,000 people so we can talk to all the stakeholders on the ground, everybody there. We expect 90% of businesses to participate with at least one reusable item. 
Then we go through an extensive design phase. We look not only at what's in the community, what assets exist, how can we use the infrastructure, like Anastasia said, that's already there, but also what do corporates and multinational needs to, need to say yes to a system like this. Also, what are reuse service providers doing? What can we employ right now that's gonna be real? We put that all together, we help build a governance model, we help with the setup, the launch, getting everybody on board and out the door. So we're really collaborative. We like to work with lots of smart people, if we can, smarter than us, to help us understand how from the very beginning to design these systems so that they really are functional. We think the word pilot is a four-letter word. Four-letter word. Because we need systems and infrastructure that is going on and going to be lasting and growing on and on and on. So I'm gonna skip through those and I just wanna talk about the critical needs from this community. There's only two and I, and I think you're gonna feel like I'm reinforcing, I hope, things you might have heard already today. So the first one, great, I'm so, we're all so happy about the policy, the legislation, everything that's there. Are we creating tools within those policies and those legislative moves to really give reuse what it needs to scale? We're gonna need that shared infrastructure. We're gonna need interoperability. So we're gonna need funding to help produce that infrastructure. And if you think one startup, two startups, five startups, 100 startups are gonna raise the money to build your public infrastructure, it's just not gonna happen. So we're gonna have to figure out how to fund that. The second one, well, I, I wanted it to like click this black in after, but my PowerPoint didn't work. What I really want this statement to say, and is my call out to the science community in particular, and for the storytellers in the room, is that not only does it have the potential to reduce the plastic pollution, but to prevent unintentional and detrimental impacts on human health. I think a lot of us in this room and a lot of the science is showing that we're possibly doing very dangerous things to our bodies as well as our environment. And that's gonna have long-term significant impacts. Let's not conflate one goal with not looking at a systems perspective for what's needed to make things truly sustainable. So we need the tools and the science and the storytelling to not only bring these systems out, but Listen, I'm talking to cities and others. We're about to put hundreds of millions of pieces of packaging into circulation for reuse. We have a GHG problem that everybody has their eye so strongly pinned on that it's very difficult for them to look at these other elements in the life cycle assessment and particularly in the chemicals of concern. I need your help to bring that message forward. Because not only is that message not landed like the plastic pollution message yet, there's a huge cost difference. So they can buy all the plastic containers they need, I don't know, for a million dollars. If they're gonna buy material that's inert, it's gonna cost them closer to $19 million. Help me make that argument Help me understand what materials are going to be safe and sustainable and healthy. So when we do get this reuse out the door, which it's out the door, but we're going to grow it, it's the right reuse. Thanks so much. A pleasure to be here as always. Thank you very much. A powerful message on reuse. We will take one question. Uh, okay, two, 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 two. As we have uh, students with us, it's, I think it's really interesting to hear from them. So if we can have then uh, two questions, and we'll try and be really, really quick. I'll huh? go quick. Yeah. Uh, could you say with confidence that the disinfection, uh, the disinfection and sanitation process like for these products is successful in ridding of germs? So I worked with the CDC and the FDA for many, many years. And I will say yes, absolutely, with one exception. We have an incredible scientist in the room today, you can, she, she's leaving, but we can, we can direct you towards her, that says there are some reusable plastic items, think 
bottles that might hold a soda of some sort, that perhaps the washing and sanitation isn't able to sort through certain smells or other particulates. For inert materials, absolutely 100%, no questions asked. Yeah, I was just curious because like, I saw like when we were doing the presentation about the renew renewables, like because it was said like to be founded in 2021 or like it started like, you know, like it's processed during 2021. And that was still like a peak for coronavirus, I feel like. Uh, yeah, even the CDC would say actually there's fewer touch points in a reusable item life circle system than there is in a single use item. When you start to think about the waste management involved in single use, there's fewer contact points. So super safe, thank you for the question. Uh, so my question is also related to that, um, but my question is how, how are these reusable guaranteeing that there's no allergies like for example for like allergens spreading across these because for people with like uh, life threatening allergies how can they guarantee that they're safe by uh, Absolutely. consuming food from these the wonderful thing is is that we've been eating off of silverware for like hundreds of years so we've gotten really good especially in commercial situations at washing and sanitizing ensuring how we pack and move items so that we can address just that okay thank you for your questions thank you thank for indulging you. me <laughs> thank you danny thank you so much